Yeah, and then what do you do? So you have all this information coming in. What do you do with that information, Brian? You just put it up on the screen and have a, something for people <laughs> and let, to come visit. And let the leadership freak out. And let leaders freak out. <laughs> but no, you, you have to have a process, right? right. I mean, you have, you have this information that comes in, and you, um, you have to have a way to triage what's happening. And you have to have protocols that have triggers. You know, protocols are standard operating procedures, but you have some written document that has some um, triggers and thresholds that tell you, tell the team what they need to go do um, and appropriately escalate those situations to the right team or the right leader to be able to deal with a situation. Right, so in uh, our previous occurring. team, we had, we had the, um, the people that would collect all the data and the information, they put it together and they push it up to what we called an incident lead at the time. Right. So then the incident lead would then <clears throat> help to determine whether or not that was a valid threat that was mm -hmm. coming in and what to do with that information. Mm -hmm. So they were sort of a specialized trained person that was able to collect all the information and figure out what to mm -hmm. do next. And their job was really to shepherd that situation through a process where roles were clearly defined, that there was an escalation right. path, there was a single source of truth for communicating what was going on. Um, there was a good crisis framework, as we would kind of describe that. Yeah. It covers all of those things and, and puts the decision um, in front of the right leader. And it gets complicated because you have these situations that come in that are, you know, perhaps more of a physical security, life safety focus, like a, a disruption or a protest internationally where you have people at risk. Um, you could have a... Uh, more of a reputational issue, like what McDonald's dealt with this morning, right. where maybe your communications team really has a point. And will be dealing with. And will they're going to be dealing with this one for a while. Um, or you could have an information security issue, a data breach or a cybersecurity event. Um, or you can have some executive misconduct, yeah. uh, financial problem yeah. that's of a totally different nature. Um, but we always encourage uh, companies to have one approach to dealing with that in terms of the same process with the same people at the table, um, bringing information forward in, the, in a consistent way for senior leaders to be both informed and to be involved in the, at the right level for decision making. Right, to avoid the freak out. <clears throat> avoid the freak out. Avoid yeah, the freak we definitely out. do not want any freaking out going on. Yeah, and a team that I think leadership really trusts to be doing what they're doing. So mm -hmm. I think that leadership trust is really important there mm -hmm. so that leadership isn't coming in and wanting to know every detail here and there. Mm -hmm. um, they know it's being handled at the lowest level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or <clears throat> and that they're involved where appropriate, where they have outlined, uh, you know, hey, as the CEO, this is where I want to be involved or I want to be the decision maker as opposed to, hey, crisis team, uh, go manage this situation, but keep me informed. Right. Let me know when I need to right. step in. That, right. Right. And those those may be some personal differences there, but um, um, usually you're looking for your issues of big strategic importance and of reputational importance for that direct C-suite involvement, and your situations that are you know lower on the scale of severity are being handled by I don't want to say worker bees, but they're handled through the kind of normal process. Right. Um, where you're informing the executives instead of having them make the decisions. Right. Or there are processes in place for that right. incident. So. Right. Yeah. We at least hope there are processes in place for incidents like that. In theory, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. So these are things we do here at Bright Path, I think, to, to kind of wrap this conversation up. Um, we've worked with a number of companies on building nerve centers. Uh, we've had situations, we've had these called everything from a command center to an operations center, to a global operations center, to a GSOC, a global security operations center. My favorite still remains the uh, intelligence center we made for, uh, or we worked on the processes for uh, a company out on the West Coast that operates globally. Yeah. But whatever you call it, the real lesson here is that you need some kind of radar screen, some kind of nerve center that brings all of this information together and you have a structured process um, that allows you to escalate that within the company to get it resolved. That's dedicated to do that. It's dedicated just to do that. Right. That's yeah. right. So if that's of interest to you, if that's something we can help you with here at Bright Path, uh, we'd certainly be interested in talking with you further about that. And I believe we have a case study on our website. We'll link in the show notes about the Intel Center uh, that we built for our clients on the West Coast. Yeah. Um, with that, that's the end of this episode of Managing Uncertainty. And we look forward to talking with you in the coming weeks. Definitely. 
Thanks for watching our video. To learn more about how to manage uncertainty and disruption in your organization, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to our video channel. And here are a few more videos that we've selected that will help you learn more about business continuity, crisis management, and crisis communications.